Welcome to module three. And in module three, we're really going to start looking at risk. And risk is the foundation of audit because our audits are risk based. And today we're going to start in topic one with understanding the client and an introduction to risk. So let's get into it. If you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail. This is really important because audit planning is the foundation of our audit. Poor planning results in piss poor performance. That's always something that one of my audit managers used to say to us. So we need to start with a good plan for the audit, but how exactly do we go about developing that plan? Understanding how that works is really important because the audit is a customized service that we provide. It's not a one size fits all type of approach. We need to make a customized audit for the particular client in their particular circumstances. That could change between different industries, it could change between different clients in the same industry, and it could also change for the same client in different years. So planning for the audit is really critical. So the standards we're going to use are in the 300 series because everything in the 300 series is related to audit planning. Um, we're going to look at things like ASA 300, which says you have to have a plan, 315, which talks about how to go about identifying the risks that are going to help drive your plan, um, and ASA 320 in future modules about materiality, and then how do we actually build the plan? So 330 is the actual strategy that we're going to use. Now you might notice that there are two 315s here, um, and I'm gonna highlight the correct one that we're going to use. We're going to use this one down here, which is the one released on the 20th of February, but it will be the one that is going to be adopted by all of the audit firms. Um, and it has a much more detailed approach. And it's actually more useful for students in terms of preparing for an audit. So one of the ones that I would really like you to go away and read is ASA 315. That's really nice and clear. So why exactly do we need planning? Well, remember I mentioned ASA 300, that's the one that says you have to have a plan and it actually goes through these particular reasons. So it says to devote appropriate attention to important areas of the audit. We wanna audit more where we think there's a greater risk of misstatement. We also need to be able to identify and resolve potential problems on a timely basis. We wanna find issues up front and organize them up front rather than worrying about them at the very end when we might be really close to the uh, reporting period. I also need to manage the engagement so that it's performed in an effective and an efficient manner. So effective means we're doing a good job. We're doing, uh, when it says effective, a high quality, audit. And efficient means that we're doing it with the least amount of effort. All right, so high quality with the least amount of effort. Because remember, the audit partner is interested in making sure that that audit is profitable. It's also going to help us in selecting the engagement and it means here, it should say team, I'm missing a word there. And then also helps us facilitate the direction and supervision of the team and reviewing their work. There's lots of people in an audit and we need to know who is doing what, when are they doing it, so that work can be checked, um, it can be supervised, reviewed appropriately. So who exactly does the planning? On most audits, the engagement partner is you know, the person who's signing the audit, so they're responsible. And ASA 300 paragraph five says key members. But the question is who are key members? That's usually managers, seniors, sometimes not graduates or interns, but really we want as many people as possible to be involved in the planning and discussion of the plan because the audit is multifaceted. You might be auditing sales that also affects accounts receivable and cash. You want all of those people to know as much about why we're doing things. You don't wanna just give juniors instructions like do this on the audit because it can create issues if they don't know why they're doing the tasks that they're doing. So having more people involved in planning is better. Even if the juniors don't actually do any of the planning, if they're sitting in the meetings, they're absorbing all this information, they're understanding what the strategy is in for the audit, that's really important. Now we also need to make sure that we check 
the independence and ethical clearance to make sure that everybody complies with the Corporations Act when it comes to the um, independence requirements and also APES 110 when it comes to the ethical clearances. Now, an important thing to note here is don't start planning the audit until we've got a signed engagement letter. Remember, the engagement letter is our contract. We don't want to do any work on this contract or not too much until we've signed and we've got an agreement because they could change their mind and then we've expended this effort for nothing. So what exactly is included in the audit? Well, our plan for our audit is called an audit program. All right, that might sound like an unusual word. There's a lot of unusual terminology in audit, but the program will tell us about the nature, timing and extent of audit testing. And what does it mean? So it means what audit procedures are we going to use? And we're going to learn a lot about the different procedures that are available. So what tools and techniques are we going to use to gather evidence? Timing is about when are we going to collect the audit evidence and the extent is going to be about how much. Now, the difficulty here is that all of these use something that we call professional judgment. There is no mathematical number that is magical that tells us how much evidence to gather or what audit procedures to use. And so this is a process where we need to learn by doing by designing audit procedures, by collecting audit evidence, by evaluating audit evidence. This is a learn on the job task that takes many years to develop as a skill. Now, there are many plans or programs for the audit. So we will have usually an overarching audit strategy, and then that strategy will have a number of different programs for different accounts. So there'll be one for sales and cash receipts. There'll be one for purchases and cash payments. Um, you'll have a whole range of different programs, so different areas and parts of the accounts. As, and as, as an auditor, you'll probably be put on sales and cash receivable as one of the first ones that you'll do as a junior. So what exactly does planning the audit involve? Well, it starts with knowing the client. You can't plan any sort of customized service unless you know them. What do they do? How do they do it? Then the next step is to identify risks of material misstatement. We already know that this goes into the audit risk model, so this is critical. So we're going to then apply the audit risk model and then develop a response to the risks. These are our audit programs and our overarching audit strategy. So we need to understand the client. That's the foundation. Now the standard is a bit confusing because the standard does say first you have to identify risks of material misstatements and then it says go understand the client. Um, even though the standard has risk first and then understanding, we're actually going to do them in reverse. I'm going to talk about what you need to know to understand the client, then we're going to get into the risk part. So what do we need to know to understand the entity? How much goes into this nebulous figure that we call an understanding. And again, this is one of those areas that is full of professional judgment. There is no specific number that says this is how much is an understanding. Auditors will tell you like it's a feeling, it's an amount I think I know when I know enough about the client. It's an idea where they have this model of what they think the client should look like and what they find. And when information conflicts, they go and they search more. So this understanding is something that we develop over time. Um, the mental models and pictures of audit firms, of sorry, of clients for junior staff are less developed than those of partners that have much more experience. So your understanding is the process of every single experience and client and training that you've had helps you decide how much you need to know to understand. Now, of course, that might be really daunting right now. I think I've just probably scared you all a little bit, but ASA 315 actually gives us some specific lists. So let's get into those. So we need to know about these areas. And when you go into ASA 315, they say entity and environment combined, but I separate them because it's a little bit easier to understand. It says we need to know the financial framework, and systems of internal control. So let's get into each of those. The first one we're going to look at is the entity. So the entity really is our client. 
All right, so we need to know about organizational structure. Um, how big is the firm? Is it part of a conglomerate? Does it have subsidiaries? Is it really flat in terms of hierarchy or is it lots of layers of hierarchy? Then we need to know about ownership. Who owns the company? Um, if it's owned by shareholders, so most of the time, uh, most of our clients that we'll look at will have public shareholders because they're public interest entities, but who are the shareholders? How much do they own? Do they have ulterior motives? In terms of governance, who sits on the board? Who sits on the audit committee? Who are the management? What are their experience? Do they have integrity? Are they good people? Or are they likely to try and mislead customers? What is the business model? How are they going to do what they do? What influences that business model? How much IT is integrated into the business model? Does that create a weakness, a failure point? Then what are the key performance indicators? Internal KPIs, which could be things like KPIs related to executive compensation. So I'll just write that as exec comp. External things could be measures like analyst benchmarks. And we know that the research shows that companies and managers that beat analyst benchmarks tend to get better share performance. They get higher buy recommendations. So there's a lot of different things about the company that we need to know. Then we also need to know about the entity's environment. So that's the ecosystem in which the client lives. And of course, there are a whole range of different things. What's the industry? How competitive is it? Is it an oligopoly? Is it a monopoly? Are there lots of small competitors? Is it, if you're in the phone industry, Apple versus Samsung? Who are our suppliers and our customers? How are our relationships with them? Do we have agreements? Is it competitive? And then also what's happening in technology in that industry? We also need to know about regulation. What are the legislation, including tax, but other things like um, you know, government subsidies? Is there government policy that might affect the entity? Then we also need to think about other things like the general economic conditions. Are there interest rates available? Is there financing for the firm? And what about inflation? Now, right now, in a COVID-19 world, all of this stuff becomes much more important in understanding the client because it could be a range of different things like your supplier for your product might be in China. Can you get the goods? What if it's in a country that's involved in significant lockdown. Is that going to affect your ability to get goods to sell? What about our customers? Will they still buy in the current environment? Or are they worried, you know, if you're a luxury goods seller, then this is not the environment for you really right now. Um, technology. Imagine if you're the company, the Zoom people, or any sort of video conferencing people. How has that changed your business, your industry? Legislation and regulation can come into it as well. So you might be forced to shut down by the government. You could be forced to make a particular product under government orders. Um, you might be affected by certain um, rescue packages or assistance packages that are coming out right now in terms of uh, finance. When it comes to the general economic conditions, we know that we're headed into a recession. It's not gonna be pretty. Interest rates right now are at 0.25%. That was the latest RBA cut. We've got really nowhere to go on interest rates. And we don't think there's gonna be a lot of free money floating around if you need to refinance a loan. And inflation, on some things, I think we're gonna see inflation increase on everyday staples as there's more demand but limited supply. So knowing the industry and the environment is really, really critical, especially in today's environment. Now, what does it mean by the applicable financial reporting framework? Well, in Australia, we're using our AASBs. If we're in the EU, we're looking at IFRS. And if we're in the US, we're looking at US GAAP. So it's quite common for Australian companies to even have to report under multiple frameworks, and that makes it even harder for the auditor. We also need to know about accounting policy choice because accounting policy choice is often where companies use accruals. And accruals are a tool for reflecting appropriate business, but they're also a tool 
for manipulation by management. So we need to be really careful that we understand that. And what are the reasons for accounting policy choice? Is it particularly profit driven? Are we flip flopping between standards? Is this what the industry is doing? So applicable financial reporting framework also means that we often need to think about industry common practices when it comes to accounting standards. The final one that we're looking at here is systems of internal control. And I'm just adding a little bit onto this diagram here because I realized I'm missing a part, but I'm going to need to understand the control environment of the client. That control environment is everything. It's management philosophy. It's their code of conduct. It's how they hire people. It's how they fire people. It's how they treat their customers. It's their organizational ethos. That sets the foundation because if you've, if you've ever worked for a shitty boss, then that's not a great place to work and you're not really going to be customer focused if the company doesn't treat its employees well. The next thing we need to look at is risk assessment. So what does the company do to assess the risks that are going to affect the possibility of that business meeting their objectives? If they don't look at risk regularly, then how do they know what could create a problem for them? Because what they need to do when they have risks is they need to implement control activities. They need to implement processes to try and mitigate or manage the risk that exists. We're gonna look at this in a whole lot more detail in a separate um, topic, but I'm just giving you the overview. We also need to make sure that we have good IT systems that collect data about all of these different processes so that we can make decisions and we can be agile. And then on the very top, we need to monitor our controls and our processes. So we need to have oversight, not just that we're doing these tasks, but we're also checking that controls are preventing issues, but also we need to know when controls stop working in case that's a bigger chance for a possibility of fraud or where something or mistakes could happen. The place where we start when it comes to identifying risks of material misstatement is actually the risks of the business. And this is really about understanding the client, understanding management's perspective, what drives management, because once we understand what drives management, what are their issues, what are the things they deal with day to day, then we can identify the risks that are more likely to affect the accounting and that we're going to need to consider with the audit. So let's look into business risks a bit more. So how do we identify the most likely places for misstatements? Well, we're going to look at something called business risks. And business risks are really the risk that management won't meet the objectives of their shareholders. Now I say shareholders here because we're talking about public uh, interest audits. So most of the time that's ASX listed companies. And for those organizations, the thing that they are most concerned about is profit as shareholders. So are they making a profit? What's the return on their investment? What's the dividend um, market to book value? So business risks are things that are going to stop them from achieving their profit objectives. We might brainstorm those with the team, but often management of the client will talk about those key risks also in their annual report. But these risks don't always result in the ROMs that we need to understand for the audit. In the audit, we're going to narrow it down to something called inherent risks. But we start with the business risks because they help us understand management's motivation. If we know what motivates management, then we can understand where they're likely to manipulate the accounts. So let's look at inherent versus business risk. As I mentioned earlier, it's the risk that they will fail to achieve their business objectives, which usually is related to profit, market share, some sort of return. Whereas the inherent risk related to uh, the audits is about the risk of material misstatements. Where is there likely to be a mistake or an error? So those material misstatements can come from a mistake, or it could be intentional manipulation. Now, what we need to do is we always start by trying to analyze what the business risks are. Then we'll also brainstorm about our inherent risks. And sometimes, just sometimes, there is a little bit of overlap, um, but not always. 
A good example here is mining firms. With mining firms, CEOs are interested in where do I dig next? How much is left in a mineral or an oil deposit in the ground? But for the accounting perspective and the audit perspective, our risk around material misstatement is how do I capitalize or expense those exploration and development costs? How do I accurately value the natural resource in the ground. So the business risks for mining firms are around finding new deposits, how much is left in their deposit, whereas the inherent risk is more related to the proper accounting treatment for those exploration costs and valuing those natural resources. So they are sometimes linked to each other, but not exactly a one for one. So what exactly is an inherent risk? It's described as a susceptibility about, of an assertion about a class of transactions balance or disclosure to a misstatement. So it's not just that an account is likely to be misstated, but a specific assertion in an account. And that's a key when it comes to identifying an inherent risk. When we want to identify an, an inherent risk, we want to make sure that we ask ourselves a couple of different questions. Question number one is, can I link it to a specific account? Number two, can I link it to a specific assertion? If I cannot link my risk to a specific account or assertion, then it's probably not an inherent risk, it's probably a business risk. So what we're looking for is something that has a greater chance of there being an error, mistake, or a fraud. And they could be quantitative or qualitative. So the risk could be in the dollar amount, that's actually reported, or it could be in the disclosures even. So some accounts like related party transactions are at greater risk for inherent errors because management make a lot of mistakes, they have an inherent desire to not report information in related party transactions, it can be complicated to do. So sometimes that disclosure can be really important as well, not just that the dollar value, that there could be a quantitative mistake. So ASA 315 actually gives us um, some guidance on where things might be more likely to be inherent risks. So the first one there is complexity. So that might be something like foreign currency translation reserve, where if you have a large number of currencies and a large number of transactions, that can get to be a really complex process. Um, the next one is subjectivity. And with subjectivity, I always like to think about impairment of intangibles. That is one area where we're much more likely to have issues um, because it's management's perception. Anything where there is estimation, then we have to think about the risk that people might have different opinions. Where there's been a lot of change. Now certainly you might think about things like revenue recognition and lease recording because there's been new standards in revenues and leases that have really changed how things have worked within those standards. Change could also be change within the broader economy. And we know that every single firm at the moment is facing that with COVID. Uncertainty, and we know that again, COVID is something where there's lots of uncertainty. Um, that could be in areas right now of going concern. Will companies survive? Can they get financing for their liabilities that they need? Is there a potential for management bias? So this could be linked to their key performance indicators. It could be if they're a market leader, they might want to keep showing that they're a market leader. Bias might be in accounts related to their own remuneration. So that's a possibility. And then the last one is what is the risk of fraud? So there might be a potential for increased theft of some inventory, or again, could be linked to KPIs for executive compensation, where they might try and fudge some of the accounting to give themselves a bigger bonus. So we're always thinking, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but we're always thinking, where is there more complexity? Where is there more subjectivity? Where is there more change? Where is there more uncertainty? Where could there be management bias? And where might be a risk of fraud 
which also comes under ASA 240, which we are going to talk about in this particular module. So are all inherent risks going to be important? Well, right now I am flicking us back to ASA 315 in paragraph 31, because paragraph 31 says, for identified risks of material misstatement, I shall assess the inherent risk by looking at the likelihood and magnitude. All right, so I need to look at likelihood. Is it gonna happen? And magnitude, how big it is, because I need to determine whether any of the assess risks are going to be significant risks. And that's really the end outcome. Our risks of material misstatement, we need to come up with, so these come from ROMs, and from our risks, we generate a list of significant risks. And in talking with um, some of the International Auditing Standard Board members that I know who are involved in the development of this standard, people like Fiona Campbell from Ernst & Young um, and Professor Roger Simnett was involved in the previous version of ASA 315, is that significant risks is really about five to seven major issues that we think are going to really affect audit planning. So significant risks is something we're also going to need to identify, but we're not going to be looking at it in this topic just yet, it's coming. So what does that ASA 315 um, paragraph 31 and 32 mean in plain English, where it did say things like, I want us to consider um, the likelihood and the magnitude, okay? So likelihood, is, is it going to happen? So this is very likely and not likely. And then the magnitude is the dollar value. It's, it's small or it's really, really big. And so the idea behind this part of the standard is that you would actually plot your risks. Risk number one, risk number two, risk number three, risk number four, risk number five. You might have a whole lot of smaller ones over here. Seven, risk eight, risk nine, risk 10. And what we're looking for is we're really looking for our risks that are going to be in, if we divide this up into our quadrants, the things that we're most worried about are going to be the risks that appear in this top corner over here, all right? Things that are likely to have a really big impact and a very strong likelihood. Now, of course, we're not fortune tellers. So 12 months ago, I wouldn't have even identified that a pandemic, which would have been really low on likelihood, could become a significant risk. But all we can do is make our assessments at the time as to what is likely to happen and how big it could be. Because if it's very likely with a high magnitude, then these are potential areas where there are going to be misstatements that we need to look for, right? We need to, for these particular risks, search for potential misstatements. So remember I mentioned that we have to identify significant risks and that our significant risks are ones that are going to be our risks of material misstatement that require special audit consideration, all right? Those are ones where we're going to do extra audit work, all right? And we would have about five to seven of these on an audit and knowing where in the quadrant they sit will help us identify whether they are significant, our showstoppers, our things that we're going to keep in our mind as we're doing the entire audit. In this video, we're going to look at identifying risks of misstatement from the aspect of fraud. So a reminder from ASA 200, which is the standard on our objective of the audit, identify and assess ROMs, whether due to fraud or error. And that's where it's really important. We've looked at the potential um, for error, because remember error is the potential that we might have a mistake. 
But what we need to look at also is intentional misstatements. And that's what's covered under fraud. Now we have a specific standard on that. That's ASA 240. And we're going to use ASA 240 to analyze risks of material misstatement from the fraud and intentional perspective. So what exactly is fraud? Well, we know that misstatements fall into two different categories. We've got errors and we've got fraud. And the error is the unintentional um, accident. So that's transposition errors, it's double counting, it's accidentally having things in the wrong place. But fraud falls into two categories, or they're two different types of fraud. The first one is what we call misappropriation of assets. And misappropriation of assets is really just a fancy word for theft, stealing stuff. It could be stealing money, it could be stealing information, um, it could be stealing inventory, property, plant and equipment. So we've got misappropriation of assets is one. The other one is something called fraudulent financial reporting. All right, and fraudulent financial reporting is really lying and misrepresenting on our financial statements. So if I record transactions that don't actually exist, if I put in the wrong disclosures, if I try and manipulate the accounts intentionally, then that's fraudulent financial reporting. So we've got two types when it comes to fraud. We have our misappropriation of assets, all right, stealing stuff, and then we have our fraudulent financial reporting. And there's no limit in terms of who, what sort of employees do each of these different types of theft. You could have CEOs and CFOs involved in stealing things, um, and you could have them involved in financial reporting. Sometimes it's entirely possible that you might have a theft first and then financial reporting fraud to try and cover up that you've stolen a whole lot of assets. So fraud can come in many different forms and certainly people engaged in fraud are always being very creative in ways that they can try and circumvent an organization's controls. And really this is all about personal gain. That's the key here is that there's personal gain, I can't spell, And the other thing that comes out of fraud is an intention to deceive. All right, this is exactly the same when it comes to university and academic integrity. If you pay somebody else to do your assignment, then essentially you're engaging in sort of like fraudulent financial reporting. You're paying somebody else to prepare the work um, and you're intentionally trying to deceive us. So cheating is actually a form of fraud as well. So here are some more examples. So that fraudulent financial reporting, we could manipulate, falsify or alter records. So it could be changing dates, changing who signed something, suppression or omission of the effects of transactions. So we're hiding stuff. And that one really is the completeness of assertion there. Recording transactions without substance. There we're breaching the occurrence and existence assertion. Things that didn't happen, but recording and saying that they are or intentional misapplication of accounting policies. And that's why understanding their accounting framework is really important and knowing what's common in that industry. So what sort of things come into misappropriation of assets? Embezzling receipts. And when they say receipts there, they mean cash receipts. So instead of receiving money from customers, you could put it into your own pocket. Um, other things could include stealing assets, so um, that could be something as small as toilet paper or stationery or pens, something as large as bigger inventory, um, intangible information like a secret pattern or a recipe or something really big. Um, certainly the Australian Defence Force is missing a whole lot of tanks and armoured personnel vehicles. They could have been stolen as assets. We could cause an entity to pay for goods they didn't receive. And that's especially common when people use company money to pay for personal items like holidays, kitchen renovations. Oh, that one comes down here. Assets for personal use. Um, but really as well, we could be in league with some sort of shonky or fake supplier. 
all right? Um, and create fake suppliers that we bill the company for services, but in, an, in reality, nothing was ever provided. So there's lots of different types of fraud and people are very, very, very tricky. So what are our responsibilities in regard to fraud? And these come out of ASA 240. So for managers, their responsibility is to design internal controls to prevent and detect fraud. So the management, the board of directors, this is their job to protect. Essentially, this is about protecting the investment of shareholders. Okay, so that's their job. They have to prevent or detect fraud. What I'm doing as the auditor is my role is to assess what they're doing to prevent or detect fraud and see whether it does a good job. Now, I do have some responsibilities. I have to be professionally skeptical. I have to be aware of the possibility of fraud. I discuss with the team the potential sources of fraud. Keep an eye out for this. Oh, I spotted something. Could that be fraud? We need to ask management about their processes for preventing and detecting fraud. So that links back up there to that. We're going to identify potential risk factors. This one is interesting because we're going to look at those risk factors. And if those risk factors exist, gather or audit evidence to decide whether there is a fraud or whether it's all okay. So we have to be aware. Now, we're not necessarily saying that every single person is lying. This is not... Um, Dr. House, if you've ever seen House on TV, where he says everybody's lying and nobody's telling the truth, but we have to look at each piece of information with professional skepticism. Does this seem right? Does this match with what we know is what is happening in the company, in the industry in general? Look at source documentation. Does this look authentic? And we're going to use a particular framework for helping us to identify what these potential risk factors might be, and that's called the fraud triangle. So the fraud triangle comes out of Cressy, and that is a criminology paper. And there's many different shapes these days for the fraud triangle, but realistically, it comes down to still the triangle. So when it comes to the fraud triangle, there are a couple of different components. The first one is the opportunity to engage in fraud. And that opportunity might arise because of a weakness in internal controls, there's no control, that might you know, prevent somebody from stealing something. So there's going to be opportunities to engage in misstatement. The next one is that people might feel incentives or they might have incentives or they might feel pressured to engage in fraud. That pressure could be internal, um, it could be external. Um, your incentives might be, oh, you know, you're a chronic gambler and there's a whole lot of reasons why you need the money. Um, you might have bet large or got involved in a shady deal where now you need to try and steal money. And the other one on the uh, final part of the triangle is attitudes and rationalizations. And this is really people's attitudes towards fraud. In big companies, we often people see people say things like, oh, look, this really wasn't that important. Um, everybody was doing it, or the company is insured for any stock that's stolen. Um, a lot of people will often say, oh, look, I deserved to get a raise. I didn't get a raise. I didn't get a promotion. And that's why I've engaged in fraud. So when we see the fraud triangle, um, the fraud triangle really says that if all of these issues are present, if there's an opportunity to engage in fraud, if there's incentives or their people are pressured to engage in fraud and their attitudes and rationalizations encourage them and they say it's okay within their mind to commit fraud, then fraud is much more likely. So a really um, relevant example here would be academic integrity and cheating. Students, there's always going to be opportunities for fraud. In order, we have quizzes that are open book um, and open device that we're doing online remotely because we're learning remotely. There's plenty of opportunity there for you to have a friend sitting next to you, be on chat with someone. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to engage in cheating just because there's the opportunity. 
You might also feel some pressure. That pressure could come from your parents. It could come because you have a really big workload and study load in these uncertain times. Um, you might know that you need a great grade to get into another degree or a particular job. Um, and that's one that I see a lot. Students, oh, I cheated because I needed a distinction average to get into this master's program. That's why I cheated. And then there's the attitude or rationalization. And a lot of students will say, oh, look, the only person I'm cheating is me, or everybody does it, or my friend did it, or these contract cheating companies make it sound so simple and easy that it's not really cheating um, because I'm not copying off someone else. It's plagiarism free. That's still cheating. So when these align, when there's opportunities, when students feel incentive and pressure, and when there's the right or the incorrect attitude or rationalization, then cheating does occur, and that becomes a big risk for us. So what does that mean for auditors? Well, for auditors, that means we need to keep an eye out for things that might be indicative of the fraud risk triangle. Do I see an opportunity for fraud? Are people incentivized in their KPIs or do I notice something else that might indicate fraud? And what are employee attitudes? If employee attitudes are all about being ethical and looking after the customer, then there might be less likelihood of their having fraud. If employees are treated poorly, they're paid poorly, they're treated like dirt, um, then there might be all of these three things that do encourage fraud in that organization. And so what we need to do is we need to look out for red flags. Red flags are essentially fraud risk triangle factors and some other factors that come out of ASA 240 that could be indicative of fraud. So we know that risks of material misstatement come from a number of different areas. We know they come from inherent risks, we know that there's a possibility of fraud risks, and we know that there's also a possibility of control risks. We haven't looked at control risks in this particular topic because it has a topic all of its own later on with special tools and techniques to help us identify control risks. But you can read a little bit ahead in ASA 315 if you're really keen. So how does all this fit into audit strategy and audit planning? Well, we know that we're going to use our audit risk model and everything that we've gathered so far to help us fill in our audit strategy and design our overall audit approach. So the outcome of gathering all of this information is about risk. We need to make an inherent risk assessment, low, medium or high. In future modules, we're going to talk about making a control risk assessment. We haven't done that part yet. Um, but again, it's on that low, medium or high scale. And then we use this information in the audit risk model to determine detection risk. And we have that matrix from a previous topic that lets us know, depending on the inherent and control risk, what our detection risk should be. So detection risk is going to help the auditor design their audit strategy. How will they gather the evidence they require? Do they need to do a lot of work? Does it need to be detailed? Does it need to be more high level? So let's look at how we make those decisions. So where there is an increased risk of material misstatement, there's increased inherent risk and there's increased control risk, then the thing I need to do is I need to expend more effort, which is time and resources, on those accounts that are at greater risk of material misstatement. So where there's a greater risk of theft or intentional or errors, um, then we need to spend more time on that particular audit. And we do it in two different ways. Number one, we collect more evidence. And number two, we collect higher quality evidence. So typically evidence from different sources corroborating each other and more in volume now, it's impossible for us to test the entire set of all transactions in the audit at this particular point in time. We select samples. So where we have greater risk, I'm going to select a bigger sample of audit evidence to help me identify where things could be going wrong. Now, my planning of my audit, um, the planning stage is about developing an overall audit strategy. And then, so that's stage one. And then stage two, is about designing the audit programs themselves. And that comes a little bit later in module, I think module four of our course. 
So in terms of overall strategy, we have one of two specific choices that we can make. Now here, those choices depend on the level of risk. Okay, I'm gonna start on the right hand side here. So where there is a higher risk of ROMs, we're going to follow an audit strategy that is called a substantive approach. That means we're going to do lots of substantial checking, detailed checking of transactions, because higher risk means that IR is high and CR is high, typically. All right, so this is a low DR situation. All right, DR is low. So in those situations, there are poor internal controls. There are lots of risk of misstatement. So really, rather than test controls that are very weak, not well designed, I'm going to go into detailed checking of transactions. All right, I'm gonna look at journal entries, I'm gonna look at a lot of documentation. Now, on the flip side, if inherent risk is low and controls are good, so low control risk is good internal controls, good procedures to prevent or detect misstatements, then my DR is going to be high because remember they move in opposite directions. And I'm going to take what we call a control, oops, let's not use that color. I'm going to take what we call a control-based approach. So what I'm gonna do is the internal controls essentially sit around the accounting information and they let correct accounting information in and they keep poor and incorrect accounting information out. So instead of testing the underlying accounting data, I'm going to test the protective layer around it. And that's what the control-based approach is all about. Rodri, did you, are you trying to knock on the door? You ran out of time. You can watch some TV for a little bit. I can't put TV on. Oh, okay. Well, you just have to chill. I'm almost finished here, okay? Okay? But I don't want to work. Okay, read a book. No, One of your aunt too books. Or look at the Animalia book. Too okay, now. just sit on the couch then and just watch the rain. Or give Zebra a pat. Yeah. Rodri, you wasted my time here. So when it comes to audit strategy and detection risk, I'm going to use this little piece of information here to draw a diagram that's going to be a little bit more helpful. Now, I'm just gonna turn my camera off. Okay, so when it comes to audit strategy and detection risk, here I'm going to look at the, oh, that's wrong. Here I'm looking at the risk of material misstatement. Okay, my ROMs. And so where ROMs is low or high, I know that my detection risk moves in the opposite direction. Okay, so where risk of material misstatement is low, detection risk is high. And where the risk of misstatement is high, detection risk is low. Okay, now I'm going to divide my diagram into different types of um, audit testing or ways that we can gather evidence. All right, so I'm going to divide this into two particular pieces here. Okay, we're gonna evolve this diagram over time, but I'm drawing a simplified version of it right now. Okay, so where control risk is, uh, sorry, where the risk of material misstatement is low, we're likely to have good internal controls. Okay, so that means that when I do my audits in this particular instance, I'm going to do a lot of testing of internal controls. I'm going to rely on those controls a lot. And then I'm only going to do a tiny little amount here of detailed substantive 
checking. Okay, the flip side here, I'm going to do this one in purple, is over here where the risk of misstatement is high. Where the risk of misstatement is high, it's very likely that there are going to be errors. All right, and we know that low detection risk means a low risk of not finding errors. So in this instance, it's very likely that there's going to be errors, but we have to do a really good job of not finding them. So then that means we're going to do a large amount of the detailed substantive checking and a very tiny amount of relying and checking on the internal controls. So when it comes to audit strategy, we're going to be somewhere, let me get my pointer up, on this continuum. All right, so we're going to figure out where the controls and inherent risk is low or high or somewhere in the middle. Where there's a very likely risk of error, I need to do a lot of detailed checking to find those errors because I don't want to be caught out and miss something. Over here, I think there's a very low risk that there's going to be errors. All right, so I'm not going to do a lot of detailed checking because I don't think it's needed. And I'm going to mostly rely on the internal controls. Now, I might also be somewhere along this section here. I could be this section here. This is a continuum where, where we decide whether it's low, medium, or high, or some sort of combination of the two, or halfway in between, comes down to our professional judgment. And we're going to work on developing this in the workshop that goes with this particular topic. So when it comes to audit strategy and planning, I'm going to create an overall strategy for my audit based on whether I'm taking that, what we call a substantive approach or whether we take a controls approach. And remember, they have different levels of detection risk that go with them. So substantive approach is when DR is low and our controls approach is when DR is high. So based on, and then we build audit programs for various accounts that should be customized based on the level of inherent and control risk. Because in the situation that I've got here for you, not everything in the client is working the same. So for sales, for example, where the risk of material misstatement is low, my strategy, I'm going to add a little column here, my DR in this instance is going to be high which means my strategy is going to be more about testing internal controls. In the next one, inventory has really high risk. So my DR needs to be low, and I'm going to go for a substantive approach. And then for property, plant, and equipment, it's medium, which means my DR is also going to be medium, which means I'm going to do a mix. I'm going to do a mixed approach of both substantive testing and testing internal controls. And this all needs to be customized. Um, as I mentioned, with COVID-19, risks that might have been very low in magnitude, but you know, or very high in magnitude, but very low in likelihood, might actually be very high in likelihood right now. So we need to assess our risk very carefully and talk to others. We're going to do some exercises in our workshop that are about how we implement this and how we make these decisions. So to recap, key things we need to think about. We need to understand the client according to ASA 315. If we don't understand the client, then we cannot assess our level of inherent risk. And we're just looking at inherent risk for this particular week. You don't need to worry about looking at control risk or learning how to assess control risk. You just need to know how control risk fits into the model. Then we looked at detection risk. What does this mean in terms of our audit strategy? Um, next, in our next topic, we're going to in our next topic, we're going to look at other ways to identify risks of material misstatements. So far, what we've done is we've looked at understanding the client, understanding the entity under 315 as our first measure to identify ROMs. If you have any questions, of course, pop them in the module discussion area and we'll answer them as soon as we can. Thanks for watching.